Hi. Today, we're going to go talk about for loops. So a for loop is a type of loop. And a loop is a just programming term for a piece of code that just keeps running. A for loop is a particular version of that that runs for a particular number of loops. And so they, they become very useful um, whenever you need to automate a task. So for example, here I have written a piece of code that does print every integer from 10 to 19 without a for loop. Cool, I can just run it. No, 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 no. <sighs> I'm bored, because that was really lame, right? We can automate this. <laughs> it's a little dramatic, but the idea is that we can write a loop that does this same thing, but automates it. And yes, I, I managed to do it across 10 values, but when you have 10,000 values, certain analyses start to take a long time to write. And so a for loop is just a way of quickly creating a, um, a line of automated code. So I, I have an example here that is very simple. It's not really something you would normally do with a for loop, um, although you certainly could. And I've done it before, especially when I was just learning and like kind of wrapping my head around like what could be done to an entire object. So like right here, vec1, I've, oop. vec1 contains the numbers 10 through 19. That's what this colon means. And when I call it, I can actually do math on the whole thing. So it's not really necessary for me to do things individual position per individual position. However, once you start like really getting complicated code written and you're trying to explore new analyses or maybe you aren't sure what where a line of code is going, it can become really useful to just write something that allows you to loop through each position. So for example, I have a lot of large variant data sets, like variants, genetic variants, where we have SNPs or indels that are present all across the genome, but I'm looking for certain positions. So maybe I want to analyze a single chromosome at a time. What I'll do is I'll write a for loop that goes through and it just isolates each individual chromosome and does an analysis all at that, at, during that round of the loop. So that's the idea. Here though, what I'm going to do is essentially replicate what was just done up here. So it's going to loop x, and I'll come back to that, in vec1. It's a weird syntax, we'll, we'll talk about it. Then it's going to print each round of the loop, it's going to print the value of x, and then it's going to sleep. And let's see what that looks like. So I'm gonna put my cursor next to the curly bracket and press control enter. What that will do is it will find the next curly bracket, it actually could have been anywhere, on this line for the record, it will find the end of this kind of closed off piece of code and it will run that whole thing. So you can see it ran all of that. Each round it's printing X and then it's pausing as it has a sys.sleep for one second. And so that's what it just did. So just to watch that one more time, each round X must be changing. So it says print X. That means X is changing each time. And that's what I think really confuses students is that especially when you run it without a, a sleep parameter. So watch what that looks like. It's just gonna go boop. You couldn't see it, right? It happened way too fast. We can loop through a value and print it extremely fast because we have extremely fast computers these days. But that's the idea. It's looping through and X is changing each time. And so I'm starting kind of backwards. I'm showing you this application because it helps you interpret this. Because this is the weirds part. This is the weird syntax that is a little bit tricky for students. So a for loop starts with the word for. That's easy enough. Then it opens a parenthesis just like you would for any other function. Except it doesn't have normal arguments inside. What it has is the name of an object that may or may not exist yet. In fact, if I clear my environment, I create vec1 and I run the loop, 
X actually appears only after running the loop. And that's because the for loop creates X. We don't have to tell it to do that. That's what happens whenever you run a for loop. It's going to overwrite whatever X was before, which again can cause its own problems. However, what does X equate to? Well, X is in VEC1. And so this in is basically its own function. Again, it's a weird syntax, but it's its own function that's going to say, all right, you're going to create X based on each position of this object to the right. So this is the object to the left. It's what gets created. This is the object to the right. That's what each value gets set to. So the first value of VEC1, this is the extract function that I just typed down at the bottom. Um, so I'm extracting the first position, is 10. And lo and behold, that's what the first value of x was. I could then change that to, all right, give me the second value. And it's 11. That's what the second value of x was. And so on. And so whenever I run this script, it creates x, overriding what was ever there before. And then it slowly prints off each one, slowly just because of that sys.sleep. That's it. That's the concept of a for loop. It, it seems like it should be more complicated, but in the end, like once you understand that this is how this line of text works, and that's what causes everything subsequently to change, depending on how this value that's changing each time gets used, you're generally going to understand like the concepts of the for loop. Now, the way that X gets used or whatever that character is, that's where it gets really tricky, and that will be in the next video. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop. If you're still interested, please go watch the second part where I go into a little bit more of an advanced and more typical usage of a for loop.